Well, it's Father's Day, and I'm kind of restricting this message to, I guess I'd say, a rather narrow audience as I look around. <laughs> I warned you when we started this series on the biblical home that not every message would directly apply to some of you, and I think I might have told you then. It's not about you. I think I probably did. It is kind of about us, though, isn't it? Us as a family and us trying to please the Lord and build those biblical homes that God wants us to have. So while you might not be a dad today, and I can't say that every point I'm going to make is going to have direct relevance to you, I will say this, you probably know a dad or two, and you probably know somebody that you could pray for and about this material that I'll be sharing with you uh, this morning. We're a ways into our series of messages on the biblical home, so it's not going to be news to anybody because we've already visited texts like Deuteronomy 6 and Ephesians 6, 4 and portions of the Proverbs and pieces of Psalm 78. So it's not going to be news to anyone that parents have the obligation of training their children. And in particular, fathers have a duty to teach them. If I were to ask you, what do you think the primary duty of a dad is? Most of you might respond, um, react by saying, I think a dad is supposed to be a provider. Well, a father is supposed to be a provider, certainly. Uh, makes a living to take care of the family that he has created. But as we look at scripture, we find a little bit of a different slant. The father is, first and foremost, the father is primarily to be a teacher, it's a father's duty to teach children. The Bible commands us to bring up our kids in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord, in the instruction and the discipline of the Lord. So dads are to be teachers. So we might have asked, well, what is it that we are supposed to teach our kids? As I've already confessed, and some of you have sort of corroborated this with me, that raising children is one of the hardest things a person could ever do, and it can be very overwhelming. And as soon as they hand us a child, we don't really automatically know what to do with that child. We're supposed to be teachers, okay. But what do we teach our children? How to throw a ball? How to drive a car? How to cook a burger? How to fix a plumbing leak? How to shoot a rifle? How to change a tire? Well, so much that we could teach. And so much that we should teach. But of course, not all of it's going to be of equal value to our kids now, is it? Perhaps the best approach for fathers is to take our cues about what to teach from the same book that commands us to teach. Consider our scripture today from Proverbs 4. These are the words of a father to his child. Most of Proverbs is exactly that, right? The beginning anyway, the instruction of a father to his child. The words of a king to kings in training. And what does perhaps the wisest earthly father of all time say in the Proverbs? What is his fatherly counsel? It is this, get wisdom. You have something to say to your kids? Tell them to get wisdom. Get wisdom, get insight. Do not forget, do not turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her and she will keep you, love her. And she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. Get the point? Whatever you get, get insight. Prize her highly and she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a graceful garland. She will bestow on you a beautiful crown. Yes. How to fly a kite how to read a tape measure, to work hard, how to make a paper airplane, a bait a hook, kindle a fire, all good things for our kids to know. Those and a million other things that dads have tried and are trying to teach their children. But among all that we're doing, dad, where does wisdom fit in the priority that the bible establishes for us is to encourage our kids in the attainment of wisdom in proverbs we see very plainly that wisdom is not just a nice to have thing it's a must have scripture 
places it very high on the list of desirables. So what is wisdom? Some will equate wisdom with knowledge, believing that wisdom is the same as knowing a lot. But that can't be true, can it? Because by now, most of us know at least one and perhaps more people who have a brain full of facts but don't know enough to come in out of the rain. <laughs> one man possesses great knowledge doesn't mean he's wise. In fact, one can hear the right things, one can know the right things, one can even believe the right things, and yet not be wise. James teaches us that the demons believe and they shudder. As Jesus finished up his Sermon on the Mount, he told a parable about two builders. One constructed his house on the sand and one on the rock. And when the storm came, the home on the sand did what? It collapsed. It came down with a crash. While the home on the rock did what? Pretty much nothing. It stood firm. It withstood the rains. What's the point of the parable that Jesus offered? We sometimes confuse this one or make a mistake. People are quick to say, well, the point of the parable is we need to build our life on Jesus. But Jesus actually tells us what the point of the parable is, right? Verse 24, we don't have to wonder what this thing is teaching us. He tells us, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them. Now, mind you, he's wrapping up a long sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. And lots of people have heard and gathered to hear what Jesus had to say. They have heard his words, but this is what he leaves them with. Rob Morang preached on this a while ago, and his first title for this message, he ended up change, changing it, but I like it. His first title was, In Conclusion, Let's Begin. <laughs> because that's what Jesus is doing here. He's dispensed all this amazing wisdom, and so many people have heard it, but this is what he leaves them with. Everyone now who hears these words of mine, and what? Does them. Puts them into practice. That's the one who's going to be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The wise person not only hears, knows, or believes, but the wise person acts on what she or he knows, hears, and believes. See, faith, real faith, translates into works, right? Real faith moves you to a particular way of being. And wisdom is not intellectual only, it's behavioral. Wisdom leads to action. What is wisdom? Wisdom is the ability to see life from God's perspective and then act accordingly. That's what it is. To see it the way that God sees it and then to do with it what God would have you to do. And James asserts that wisdom is observable. It is demonstrable. That is, when a person is truly wise, it will be obvious. Who is wise and understanding among you? That's a great question in the 13th verse of chapter 3 of his epistle. Who is wise and understanding among you? We read from the top because that whole section starts with the idea that not everybody should be a teacher. But people are clamoring to be teachers. Who do you listen to? Wise teachers. Well, then who is that? Who is wise and understanding among you? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. The one who is truly understanding lives in the meekness of wisdom. That word meekness means gentleness. Gentleness is not a celebrated virtue in our day, is it? No, we live in a society that re rewards squeaky wheels. Don't we? The squeaky wheel gets the grease. And that's the society that we live in, the loud, the raucous, the demanding, and the other side, the capitulating, the I'll give you what you want if you'll be quiet. Yes, you can have a candy bar if you leave me alone. Don't do that, mom and dad. 
Because every time you go to the grocery store, yeah, you're gonna, it's going to cost you at least one candy bar. But that's the society we live in. We don't live in a society that, that thinks a lot about gentleness or meekness. And yet Jesus elevated this attribute to, to, to an important place, right? In his example and in his teaching, he elevated meekness. In the ESV study Bible note on this verse in James says, meekness comes not from cowardice or passivity. We wouldn't say that Jesus was cowardly or passive but rather from trusting God and therefore being set free from anxious self-promotion. So dads, encouraging our kids to get wisdom is ultimately encouraging them to trust in God. And those who are filled with God's wisdom are settled and they are confident that God's going to take care of them. So they're not motivated by jealousy. They're not motivated by selfish ambition. Jealousy and selfish ambition belong to the people who feel they need to make everything happen themselves. Perhaps you've been caught in that cycle. I know I have. Where I think I'm responsible to make this thing happen. What happens if something goes wrong? What happens if something gets in my way? But James contrasts the one who lives by that earthly wisdom, thinking too highly of ourselves, which, by the way, he says is unspiritual and even demonic, with a person who is wise, who trusts in God. The wise person is like King David in Psalm 131, who declared, I have calmed and quieted my soul like a weaned child with its mother, like a weaned child is my soul within me. David describes here in Psalm 131 the contentedness of someone who knows who they are because they know whose they are. Did you catch that? They know who they are because they know whose they are. I am a child of God. Therefore, I can rest. Therefore, I do not have to be driven by jealousy or selfish ambition. Wisdom allows us to be content. We want kids who are going to be ambitious. We want kids who work hard. But we don't want kids who are never satisfied. We don't want kids who don't ever come to an understanding that they can be content with what their father has given them. The preacher warns us about this This type of dissatisfaction in the book of Ecclesiastes he who loves money will not be satisfied with money nor he who loves wealth with his income this is all vanity that's that's Ecclesiastes 5:10 which basically what he's saying is our disordered loves which come from our disordered beliefs about what we truly believe will bring us happiness lead to dissatisfaction disordered loves Based in faulty thinking, we think this is going to make us happy. We think this is going to make us content. In fact, it leads only to dissatisfaction. But wisdom helps us to love the right things. Wisdom teaches us about what is most valuable. Wisdom helps us to learn what is truly satisfying. What we were built for, beloved. What we were made for. Where does this wisdom come from? Don't you just wish that it came in a box and you could pick it off the shelf at Walmart? You're just going to skip out and get me a little bit of wisdom. But it doesn't work like that, does it? Where does one get this wisdom? James is helpful again. In the first chapter, in the fifth verse of, of his epistle, he says, If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given to him. Wisdom comes from above. Wisdom comes from God. The wisdom that we need comes from God. And the good news is God is more than happy to give it to us when we ask. If you find yourself in a bind and you don't know which way to turn, this says that God is more than happy to give you the wisdom that you need. And beyond that, not only is he willing to give it to you, he's going to give it to you generously. And not only is he going to give it to you abundantly, he's going to give it to you without reproach. What does that mean? He is not going to upbraid you for needing it. Sometimes we're a little uh, hesitant to come to God. God, I should know this by now. 
God, I should be better than this. God, shouldn't this be plain to me? And we sort of approach the Lord with our hat in our hand. God, uh, that's not at all the God we serve. He's looking to bless, not upbraid. The wisdom we need comes from him. He's happy to give it to us. It's the wisdom that comes when we pray to God for guidance. It's the wisdom when, that we get when we read his word, the Bible. Dads, let me ask you this. How much time do you spend reading the Bible? How much time do you spend reading the Bible? How much time do you give compared to everything else that's competing in your schedule for your time and your attention? How much do you give to plumbing the depths of God's holy word. Remember the words of Ben Watson, right? We can't give our kids what we don't have. We can't give our kids what we don't have. The wisdom they need most is the wisdom from God's word. So let me ask you, Dad, how are you going to get that wisdom to them? Do you have it? Do you know it? How well do you know this word? And do you love it? Do you love that word? Is it sweeter than honey? Do your children see how important it is to you? And better yet, do you read this word with your kids? I knew when we started this series on the biblical home that it was going to be a series of lessons for me and things I didn't do right. How many of you, if you could turn back time, would take your kids into your laps and make sure they know the story of redemption? Fathers teach. Fathers train. Bring up your children. Remember this, if you're not teaching them, someone else is. That leads us to a final question. Why is it important for us to have wisdom for fathers to equip their children with it? What's the deal here? Alistair Begg would say, okay, we got the what. We got the imperative. The fathers must teach or train their children to get wisdom. Well, what's a so what? Why does this matter? Let me offer you three reasons for fathers in particular, for parents in general, to encourage their children towards wisdom. And let me also say, reminded you uh, uh, probably last week or a couple weeks ago from Spurgeon that we must never cease to pray for our children. If you're sitting here today going, ah, the ship sailed and I don't have a chance. To... No, that's not necessarily true. I'm 56 years old. I'm soon to be 57 years old. I really like going to my mother's house and eating macaroni and cheese. <laughs> you're always a son. You're always a daughter. You're always a dad. You're always a mother. You have influence. You have opportunity. Don't despair. Let me give you some reasons why it's important that we want to always encourage our children toward wisdom, whether they're 3, 33, or 63. Knowing true wisdom is going to help your kids to discern between the real thing and the pseudo wisdom that is out there. I think of, of, of the kids in high school today, I think of a lot of our kids in the church, our, my grandkids, bombarded daily with cultural messages steeped in what we might call the wisdom of the day. It's, it's people's best guess at figuring out what life ought to be like. The problem, of course, I don't blame anybody for trying to figure that out, not at all. The problem is most people are trying to do it without considering or factoring in God, right? So they're just trying to make sense of the world, but we don't have any sense of God or his expectations. Well, kids are constantly up against this. As Christians, we are familiar with Romans 1. We know that fallen man, very often, while professing to be wise, becomes what? A fool. And there's a lot of foolishness out there, isn't there? There's a lot of teaching out there these days that's considered wisdom that to, to somebody who understands the scripture is looking at it and going, really? Somebody thinks that makes sense? 
that's calling black white and white black. And Isaiah said that day was going to come. There's a ton of foolishness in our world and people are trying to make sense of life without a concept of God and wisdom. Biblical wisdom is going to help our kids to know the difference between the right way and the wrong way. It's going to help our children to discern between good ideas and bad ones, between theories and realities. I'm sure you figured this out. We can't always be around our kids. We're not always going to be present to help them sort through the challenges that they might face on any given day. But if we can teach them wisdom, if we can teach them basic principles of truth from God's word, that's going to help them to do the work that we would do with them if we were right there, which is to discern the relative health or disease of whatever it is that's in front of them that day. Oftentimes, they're confronted with this foolishness and they're pressured to believe it, to accept it, to receive it, and to call it true. Wisdom's going to help them to stand firm against that. Secondly, wisdom brings its own reward. It's kind of, it's kind of like that old idea that there is, there is a reward in clean living. There really is. Proverbs 3, blessed is the one who finds wisdom and the one who gets understanding for the gain from her is better than gain from silver and her profit better than gold. She's more precious than jewels and nothing you desire can compare with her. Long life is in her right hand and in her left hand are riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness and all her paths are peace. She's a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. Those who hold her fast are called blessed. So what the scripture teaches is that the natural consequences of abiding in wisdom are good and desirable. Right? Our scripture from Proverbs 4 says, get wisdom and you'll be kept by wisdom. Get wisdom and wisdom will guard you. Get wisdom and you will be exalted. Get wisdom and you'll be honored as you finish the race. Get wisdom and you will wear the crown of a conqueror. To live in wisdom is to be blessed in ways that one wouldn't be in the pursuit of folly. That's all that is. Wisdom is key to blessing. And we can translate that word also as happiness. Wisdom is key to happiness. Now that doesn't mean, of course, that everyone who follows wisdom will have a pain-free, prosperous life. And we read the Proverbs wrong when we read them as promises. They're not promises, but they are general principles of truth. Follow God's way, and it will be better for you. When a person follows God's way, good things happen for them. But here's the thing, if or when they don't, because we live in a fallen world, having and living by God's wisdom will help them endure the storms of life. Wisdom matters. You would say, why does this matter? Wisdom matters because rain's coming. Wisdom matters because floods are coming. Wisdom matters because high winds are coming and they're going to beat on the house of your life. They're going to beat on the house of your kid's life. The storm that Jesus spoke about is a metaphor, right, for the inevitable trials and the threats that will assail your home and everyone in it. And he teaches that wisdom, knowing his words, putting them into practice, is what's going to help you and your loved ones to withstand and endure all those assaults. Of course, the greatest storm we face, and some believe that's what Jesus is talking about in Matthew 7, in the storm, in his parable, the storm of death and the judgment that follows. C.J. Bahaney puts it this way. He says, our job, ultimately, what parenting is about is about preparing our children for the final day. All parenting is ultimately a preparation for that day when your child will stand before the judgment seat of Christ and give an account. Are your kids ready for that? Are you making your kids ready for that? Are you ready for that? If our kids know God, if they have a relationship with him, if they are saved by Christ, if they walk with him, they will be equipped and empowered to handle whatever life throws at them. 
they'll be able to live well, prayerfully, long after you are not around to protect them. Long after you're not around to bail them out. Statistics say you're going to be leaving this earth before your child. Will that parting be temporary until you meet again in heaven? Or will it be eternal? Let me wrap this up with a, one other thought when it comes to your children. What are you going to be leaving behind, Dad? What besides a garage full of junk are you going to be leaving behind? What's your legacy? <laughs> How prepared are your loved ones to live well in your absence? And I don't mean financially, that's important, but that can change in a minute. We all know that. I mean spiritually. What are your children going to know from you that's going to bless them long after you're gone? How will your teaching and your example eternally influence the generations, not just of your child, but of your family? Family that you'll never meet on this side of things. Think about that. The psalmist gives great hope for a father's faithful instruction, for the handing down of wisdom. And if you're here today having come from a line of fathers who were not godly or who did not teach you about God, the psalmist gives hopes that you might be the one to break that cycle. To guide your family off the path of folly and condemnation. And to put your family on the path of righteousness and eternal blessing. Because we read it in Psalm 78. Because he, God, established a testimony in Jacob and appointed a law in Israel. Which he commanded our fathers to teach to their children. That the next generation might know them. The children yet unborn and arise and tell them to their children so that they should set their hope in God and not forget the works of God, but keep his commandments and that they should not be like their fathers, stubborn, rebellious. A generation whose heart was not steadfast, but whose spirit was not faithful to God, that you might teach your children who will teach their children, who will teach their children to put their hope in God. When it's all said and done, there's nothing more precious that we can hand down, is there? Nothing more important than the wisdom of God, the knowledge of the promise of eternal life in Jesus Christ, which is shared not only in our words, but also in our lives as we teach our kids to set their hope on God, to believe in him, to supply their needs, their immediate present, and their eternal future. Father, we thank you for the hope that is in your word. And we ask you to forgive us for not always following it ourselves. We pray that we have been challenged and will be changed this day because of your truth. That would be more faithful to your way and not the way that we learned, that we observed, that we just sort of perpetuated, which is so easy. Lord, I pray for the dads in this congregation that we might seriously take the mantle of leadership that you hold out for us to take and that we would, that we would endeavor to be good teachers and to insert your wisdom and to encourage our children to live for you, which, of course, begins with our living for you in every way. Mold us and make us into who you want us to be so that we can see this promise of your word fulfilled through the generations of families that rise up to praise you and that will know the gift of eternal life. We pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.